And I'm Keith Jones. Today's demonstration is peaceful and devoid of the violence that we saw over the weekend. NBC okay, Alyssa, thank you. Meanwhile, Florida's governor also issued a statement regarding protests around the Sunshine State. Today, Governor DeSantis thanked leaders for their help keeping residents safe. He also announced 700 Florida National Guard soldiers and more than 1,300 Florida Highway Patrol troopers are being deployed to help support local law enforcement. DeSantis also spoke out about the weekend protests, saying in part. And I'm Keith Jones. Thank you for being with us. We continue our team coverage here on NBC6. We begin with NBC6's Tony Pipitone. Thank you. Meanwhile, starting Monday, public schools in Miami-Dade and Broward counties will close because of the coronavirus. The Archdiocese of Miami also closing schools next week. Patience is going to be key. Okay, Ari, thank you. And as you heard Ari mention there, Palm Beach County Public Schools will close starting next week. Classes are expected to resume March 30th. Monroe County Schools are closed next week as scheduled for spring break. But not everyone has that option. How the coronavirus is impacting employees all across South Florida. During these stressful times, Broward County Public Schools want to make parents confident that their kids will be safe at school. When we launched this series, our goal was to tell the personal stories driving people to free food distribution sites during these very difficult times. But what happened went beyond that. Here's NBC6 reporter Stephanie Bertini. South Florida Police Chief uses her own personal experiences as motivation to strive for change within her department. Now to an NBC6 behind the scenes look inside the city of Miami Police Department's real time crime center. Now to the latest on the coronavirus here in South Florida. Tonight we're getting a better picture on how many people are currently hospitalized with the virus. So our case is going up now that we're reopening NBC6 anchor Carlos Suarez. Once you get into the, some of these side streets here over there by Century Village, it, it kind of it, you don't have as much traffic, which is a great thing here. But uh, nevertheless, this guy's going to be he's going to hit some uh, high traffic volume areas again, and it's going to be dangerous when he comes to the intersections. So to recap here, there was an armed robbery that took place here on Lejeune Road. It was the Regent Jewelry Shop down on Lejeune and Miracle Mile. Um, we, we're hearing reports that one person was shot, still working to confirm those details. Uh, the suspects jumped into a UPS truck. There are two suspects, we're told, and also the UPS driver is in this truck. They took uh, the turnpike, they headed up the turnpike to 75, they got off on Pines Boulevard, and they uh, just headed into some, some side streets there. Coral Springs police respond to thousands of calls every single year. It's everything from domestics to traffic stops, to even active shooter calls. They put us through some very real life scenarios and it might make you think twice about the job they do. Guys, 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 Coral Springs police. Coral Springs police training. They put us through 10 different training scenarios. What we wanted to get out was for the media to understand a first-hand experience of what law enforcement deals with on a daily basis. It pounds home the point just how scary and dangerous an officer's job is. Approaching a car at night from the wrong side during a simple traffic stop can turn deadly. Turn down the music, please. You ran a red light. What we do? You ran a red light. I returned to the cruiser to write the ticket. Turning my back, I'm dead. This is what you didn't see because you're on the wrong side. What are you missing there? Gun. Gun. Same scenario, this time the threat is immediate. What are you doing? <laughs> fire, fire back. Uh -oh, uh -oh. An officer has to approach the job with the mentality that once there's an imminent threat, force, even deadly force, should be used. I receive a call about a burglary in progress. It appears a man is breaking into an apartment in the dark. Drop what's in your hand. Drop you what's in your hand. I told Back you up. That I live here? Back up. Come here, look. Back Show up. Where I live. It was a man who locked himself out of his own apartment. Kids inside. Now show him what your weapon was. So you perceived at the moment you pulled the trigger that you had a lethal threat against you and you defended yourself. That means your shooting was good. It was a justified shooting. Another call. A warrant for the arrest of an out of control woman. I have to cuff her. Not so easy. What's your name? Get off the roof. Get off the roof. What are you going to do? How does that look? Does it sound like you were absolutely beating her senseless when she's screaming, I'm a mother, I'm a mother, and here you are a man? You're a man. 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 you my partner is shot. I shoot her, but not before being shot myself. It would be considered a justified shooting of a child. Do you want to see your kids again? Then you, you sometimes you got to make that decision. Right. You know, and whether they're 10 or 95, 
doesn't matter. Are you going to be crucified by the public? Of course. Absolutely, because all you're going to see is that you shot a 10-year-old. Officers can de-escalate scenarios peacefully. They can do it with force, sometimes with deadly force. And even if it's justified, they still face the scrutiny of the media and the community. A police officer's job seems to be a no-win situation. In Coral Springs, Keith Jones, NBC6 News. Heat highlights as they took on a look to build up some steam here towards the end of the season and then needed to. Hurricanes football started spring practice and there are some high expectations for head coach Manny Diaz and the Canes. 24-7 Hurricanes beat reporter Andrew Ivins in studio discussing what he saw on the gridiron over the past week. And historic match with some heartbreaking moments here. We're going to break down the ups and downs from Inter-Miami CF's match against DC United. And South Florida's number one goalie became the first player to have his jersey elevated to the rafters of the BB&T Center. We relive the historic moment in Sunrise. All right, the Miami Heat responding to, to some terrible losses here against really bad teams with a four-game winning streak here. That included a huge win against the Milwaukee Bucks, but those games were at home. Their loss Friday in New Orleans served as a reminder of their struggles away from the AAA, hoping to right the road troubles, though, against the Washington Wizards tonight. Another loss for the Heat was Jay Crowder. He didn't play because of a concussion protocol. Because of this, he was uh, hit by Zion Williamson there. Well, it wasn't a problem for the Heat early on here. Duncan Robinson feeds to Bam, and there's the slam. Heat open up 16 to a 7 run. Later in the quarter here, Davis Bertans, the Latvian laser, hits his first of eight three balls tonight. Guy was on fire. Heat still up by seven. Second quarter, Bam Adebayo gets the tip off the rebound and the foul. Heat up by nine. The Wizards go on a bit of a run here to end the half, but Kendrick Nunn makes sure the Heat go into locker room with a lead. Nunn with three of his 18 points tonight right before the half.